So uh, first we must uh, say that uh, all these videos from the Meet the Expert sessions will be uploaded very soon in the WPA uh, website and they will be accessible for everybody. Uh, and for today, our first speaker is Professor Raymond uh, Lam, who is Professor and uh, Leadership Chair in Depression Research in the Faculty of Medicine at University of British Columbia and Associate Head for Graduate and Undergraduate Education for the UBC Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Lam is also Director of the Mood Disorders Center at the Javad Mohavarsan Center of uh, Brain Health in Vancouver. His research examines clinical and biological factors in seasonal, treatment-resistant and workplace depression, biomarkers, clinical trials, clinical guidelines, digital technologies, and global mental health. Dr. Lam is also a lead investigator for the Canadian Biomarker Integration Network in Depression and executive care of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Digital Hub for Mental Health. It is hosted at the UBC. Uh, his research is, is supported by many sponsors, including the Canadian Institutes uh, of Health Research. Dr. Lam has received many awards for his research and teaching. For example, the JM uh, Clackron Award for Clinical Research of the Canadian uh, Psychiatric Association in 2015, a Distinguished Achievement Award for Overland Excellency, UBC Faculty of Medicine 2014, the Silver Anniversary Leadership Award of the UBC Medical Alumni 2006, and the inaugural Douglas Uting Prize and Medal for Depression Research in 2001. Uh, Professor Lam will, uh, is, as, as I said, is our first speaker and will talk about the measuring and the treatment of cognitive deficits in depression. Raymond, it's uh, both a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fontoakis, for that uh, lovely introduction, and to uh, Professor Morozov uh, as well for inviting me for this uh, presentation. Uh, it's a, truly a pleasure and uh, honor to be here. Uh, so I'm talking about a very important uh, um, uh, clinical issue uh, in our management of patients with depression, namely uh, cognitive deficits. And we're going to focus on uh, cognitive deficits and in particular their effect on functional impairment uh, in depression. And I'm going to show some data from our um, Canadian Biomarker Integration Network uh, looking at uh, those, uh, those issues. Uh, this is just my uh, disclosure statement and the uh, sources of some of my uh, funding, uh, also available at my website, uh, drraymondlam.ca. But obviously, you know, depression is a global medical problem. And no matter what region of the world, uh, depression is a very common condition. Uh, the World, Horth uh, world Health Organization estimates that over 322 million people suffer uh, with depression worldwide, which really represents an 18% increase in the 10 years between 2005 and 2015. And depression is a very, um, uh, impairing condition in terms of functioning. And so if we look at a metric of uh, years lived with disability, depression is or will soon be the number one leading medical cause of years lived with disability. And that's estimated at oh, the equivalent of 54 million years of uh, lives lost because of uh, disability. And of course, given the worldwide pandemic, we know that this is likely going to get worse, that more people, that depression is increasing with the um, results of the pandemic and the pandemic restrictions. And so it's very important that we look at uh, treating uh, depression and really trying to optimize our treatment of depression. Because even though we have many treatments, unfortunately, they're still variably effective. One way to improve treatment, of course, is to uh, use clinical guidelines. And I've been fortunate to be a co-editor of our Canadian Network for Mood and Anxiety Treatments, uh, CANMAT Depression Guidelines, that we published in uh, 2016 as a theme issue in the uh, Canadian Journal of Psychiatry, really giving recommendations, evidence-based recommendations for all of the treatments that we have uh, for uh, depression. 
we also recognize um, that uh, busy clinicians may not have time to read the full issue. And so we've actually developed a pocket guide which summarizes succinctly uh, the recommendations uh, given. But we've also developed a patient guide to the guidelines that was written by patients for patients and families so that they uh, can learn about the recommended treatments for depression. And again, this uh, patient um, uh, uh, guideline, as well as the full guidelines are available at our uh, website, canmat.org. But in our CANMAC guidelines, we focus on recovery in major depressive disorder. And our concept of recovery has changed uh, over the years. Initially, we uh, considered syndromal recovery when people no, were, were treated and then improved and no longer met syndromal criteria for a major depressive episode. This is kind of equivalent to what we mean by clinical response. 50% improvement in um, a depression rating scale, for example. But we recognize that syndromal recovery really isn't good enough because if patients are not in symptomatic recovery, if they're not in symptom remission, we know their outcomes are poor, higher chance of relapse, poor functioning. And so then the target became symptom uh, remission as an important um, uh, aspect of recovery. But for our patients, they regard functional recovery as more important than symptom recovery. And so now the target of treatment for depression really is ensuring that our patients recover their functioning to baseline because that's what's important to patients. And we know that there are many things that can um, interfere with functional recovery. That includes uh, things like uh, chronic, recurrent, and severe episodes of depression. Depressions that's difficult to treat if it's taken a long time to get them uh, feeling better. Comorbidity can interfere with functional recovery, uh, whether that's psychiatric or medical comorbidity, and the presence of residual symptoms. And in particular, there are some residual symptoms like cognitive problems that are even more important in terms of impairing functional recovery, and we'll talk about that. But we, we also recognize that depression, of course, has many different types of symptoms. There are emotional symptoms, including the uh, mood and anxiety experienced by patients with depression. There are physical symptoms like sleep and appetite problems. And then there are cognitive symptoms, uh, some of the uh, concentration memory problems, feelings of guilt and self-blame, hopelessness and suicidal thoughts. You know, when we talk about severity of depression, we often sum, we often consider all symptoms of depression as kind of equally important. But in fact, now it seems um, there's more and more evidence that some symptoms are more important than others when it comes to their impact on functioning. And we recognize that because of uh, studies like this one, uh, this is the uh, from uh, data from the large US star D study, uh, the large effectiveness study, uh, where they looked at 30, over 3,700 uh, people with depression. And they looked at specific symptoms based on a symptom scale. In this case, it was the quick inventory of depressive symptomatology self-rated. And they looked at the impact of individual symptoms on functioning as um, evaluated, assessed by the uh, work and social adjustment scale. And what they found was that not all symptoms interfered with functioning uh, with the same impact. And in fact, three symptoms, sad mood, concentration, and fatigue, were the only ones that were significantly associated with functional impairment on the uh, work and social adjustment scale. The others were not significantly um, uh, associated uh, with uh, functional impairment. So I think this shows the importance of some of these symptoms, particularly cognitive symptoms like concentration alongside of fatigue and sad mood as being particularly important for functional impairment. In fact, across all the domains of work and of the work and social adjustment scale, work, social life, 
family life, only concentration and fatigue actually predicted functional impairment across all the domains. So again, showing the importance of cognitive symptoms in terms of its effect on daily functioning. Well, if cognitive um, dysfunction is so important in depression, how do we assess cognitive dysfunction? Well, we can assess it with neuropsychological testing and with self-report measures or questionnaires. Of course, neuropsychological testing is really kind of the gold standard objective test of cognitive functioning. The problem though with neuropsychological testing, of course, is that it's not very accessible for routine clinical care. It takes uh, usually uh, several hours to do, very specialized training, really not practical for uh, routine clinical use. The other issue with neuropsychological testing is that it gives you a snapshot, a point in time assessment of uh, cognitive functioning. And it's usually done in a stress-free environment where people are, you know, a quiet environment where you can uh, really um, get uh, what, what might be considered optimal cognitive functioning. So that's why for busy clinical settings, self-report measures uh, may be more practical and more feasible to use in terms of assessing cognitive uh, dysfunction. And there are many uh, scales that we'll talk about that can be used uh, to uh, get a quick assessment of uh, some of the cognitive complaints and problems that patients are having. However, the, the, the problem is, is that many studies have shown that subjective cognitive measures have no correlation with objective measures of neuropsychological functioning. And so they seem to measure different things. And if we think about it, the self-report measures may be more applicable to real life because when people are self-assessing their cognition, they're thinking about their cognitive problems in many different types of situations, whether that's at work or at home, during stressful times, during not stressful times. So it may be a little bit more indicative of real life functioning than the point in time measure of neuropsychological testing. But realistically, it would be very helpful to have both objective and subjective assessment of uh, cognition. So I'm gonna um, talk a, a little bit about some data from our Canadian Biomarker Integration Network in Depression, CANBINE, uh, which, uh, is a, um, uh, which has been uh, running now for about 10 years in Canada. And the, the objective is to integrate imaging, clinical and molecular markers to identify predictors of treatment response. Um, uh, not only medications, but also uh, psychotherapy, neuromodulation uh, treatments uh, across this broad range of interventions. And in CANBINE, we've developed uh, integrated platforms, standardized uh, assessments, that can be done uh, through different centers and through different, uh, you know, for example, imaging uh, machines uh, so that we can pool data uh, together and uh, be able to uh, increase the sample size of that way. And you'll see we've have these standardized uh, integrated platforms uh, for a, vari a variety of assessments. Um, but we particularly wanted to look at pre practical, pragmatic predictors of treatment response. So we didn't really believe that everyone will have a um, fMRI uh, prior to starting on an antidepressant medication. And that's why we included things that are uh, more feasible for routine clinical practice, like uh, EEG, um, in terms of our um, assessments. Now, uh, we had a, a nice discussion earlier um, talking about the um, uh, challenges of uh, diagnoses. And so for our clinical assessments, we really took a pragmatic and agnostic um, uh, 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 direction in terms of our assessments. So we, we used traditional scales of uh, depression, including the Montgomery Asperger Depression Rating Scale, widely used to uh, measure treatment response. Um, but we also were very interested in dimensional uh, scales. So outside of uh, our classification systems, uh, more in terms of their research domain criteria, for example, in the US, 
we use dimensional scales to measure a number of dimensions, including things like reward, anhedonia, circadian rhythmicity, um, exercise, uh, childhood maltreatment, which we'll talk more about, pain, for example, because we recognize that there are many different aspects to depression that may not just be represented by the nine symptom criteria in DSM-5. And of course, um, you know, when we started out relatively novel, not any longer, uh, we, we used uh, integrated bioinformatics and data science using machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence uh, techniques uh, to, um, uh, to integrate uh, all of these uh, measures in terms of uh, treatment response. So just to um, kind of talk about our first study, um, which was uh, a, a, um, a treatment study looking at predictors of antidepressant treatment. And so a very simple study, again, pragmatic study where we um, screen people and um, uh, uh, admitted people who had major depressive episodes. Um, and we treated them with escitalopram, SSRI, uh, widely used medication, 10 to 20 milligrams for eight weeks. And at the end of eight weeks, the responders, people who um, had improved by 50% or more on the, on the Montgomery Asperger depression rating scale, we continued them on escitalopram for another eight weeks, 16 weeks in total. For the non-responders at eight weeks, we added aripiprazole two to 10 milligrams for eight weeks to the escitalopram. So they had augmentation treatment with uh, this atypical antipsychotic. So this was a 16 week study, open label, no placebo. And we uh, examined all of our uh, markers, potential predictors at several time points uh, through the, um, uh, through the uh, protocol. Now, when we looked at uh, cognition, we used a simple computerized cognitive battery called the uh, CNS Vital Signs uh, battery. And again, we are pragmatic. We wanted something that could potentially be used in clinical practice. So this particular computerized uh, battery takes only about 20 or 25 minutes to, uh, to do. And it consists of uh, seven tests of um, you know, looking at uh, that, that assess um, the important domains of cognition and gives you an overall uh, global score called the neurocognitive index that uh, is an overall measure of cognitive functioning. And what we found, uh, for example, in uh, the first eight weeks when we uh, are, sorry, at baseline, uh, when we compared the 200 uh, patients that we um, examined in this study compared to um, about 112 healthy control that you can see that for the overall neurocognitive index, again, uh, the higher the score, the better is the cognition. You can see there was a significant deficit in the patients, a significantly lower cognitive index compared to the healthy comparison uh, patients. And really across all of the dimensions uh, assessed in our cognitive uh, battery, uh, the uh, patients um, had poor cognition. Uh, this was statistically significant for cogn uh, composite memory and for psychomotor speed. So this is not new um, data. Uh, many, many studies, many, many meta-analyses have shown that uh, depressed patients have cognitive deficits that can be demonstrated with uh, cognitive testing. But we were particularly interested in some of the functional uh, impairment uh, associated with cognition. And again, when we look at the uh, key domains of cognition, and all of these domains can be impaired in people with cognition, uh, with depression, it's no surprise that it leads to significant impairment in daily functioning, particularly problems with executive functioning, uh, problems with planning, organization, um, multitasking. And so in our CANBIND study, we assessed functioning using a simple scale, the Sheehan Disability Scale, widely used in uh, depression treatment studies, only three items asking for interference of functioning in work or school functioning, social life functioning, or family and home 
uh, responsibilities uh, functioning. So again, the higher the scores on the scale, the greater is the uh, functional impairment. And so when we looked at baseline uh, results in terms of the cognitive deficits that, patient ha that patients had, and these are the same data that I showed before, but now these are the differences, the deficits uh, compared to healthy control populations, where the farther down the bar goes, the greater is the deficit uh, compared to healthy controls. We, we looked at the association with functional impairment, and we found that there were two predictors of functional impairment in these cognitive domains, composite memory and psychomotor speed. And so those were predictors of particularly the work and study item on the Sheehan disability scale. And these were predictors independent of the severity of the depression. Again, showing how important some of these cognitive domains are in terms of their effect on uh, patients functioning. Of course, when we're talking about cognitive dysfunction in depression, we have to think about other potential uh, reasons for cognitive dysfunction. And so uh, there's a differential diagnosis or a contributing factor that might relate to, for example, age-associated cognitive decline in older uh, patients, uh, the differentiation between, uh, with uh, mild cognitive impairment. Of course, we always have to rule out the beginning of a dementing uh, disorder like Alzheimer's. But we also know that sleep disorders and brain trauma can cause um, uh, cognitive uh, problems. And in particular, medical conditions like obesity and diabetes also associated with uh, cognitive impairment independent of uh, depression. And of course, we have to remember that uh, many of our psychotropic medications can have cognitive side effects, particularly those with anticholinergic effects. And then that patients, of course, can be uh, using and misusing substances, which can also um, contribute to cognitive uh, dysfunction. But more and more, we're also recognizing that an important factor is childhood maltreatment or abuse. We know that child maltreatment is associated with increased rates of depression in adulthood and also can um, be uh, associated with cognitive deficits by itself. And so for our Canbind study, we were, we were very interested in doing a very um, comprehensive assessment of childhood maltreatment. And so we, instead of using a questionnaire, we used a semi-structured interview. The Childhood Experience of Care and Abuse Interview. And this is done by trained raters using a semi-structured interview. It's a well-validated uh, interview that seems to provide more accurate information than a simple questionnaire. The experiences are rated on what you know, are more objective behaviors and experiences. And then there are subcategories with this interview uh, looking at emotional, physical and uh, sexual abuse. There's a, a severity um, scale associated with these domains um, and ranging from none through to moderate or marked um, uh, severity of the particular type of childhood maltreatment. And so for our purposes, we defined maltreatment in childhood as moderate or marked experience in any of the three subcategories. So we examined uh, the uh, presence of childhood maltreatment in the healthy controls and the patients uh, in our CANBINE 1 study. And so we came up with these four categories. For the healthy controls, the majority, uh, 80 of the 102 patients, had no history of childhood maltreatment. Uh, about 20% uh, did have a history of maltreatment. Whereas for the depressed patients, it was about 50-50. About half the patients uh, with depression had no history of maltreatment. The other half did have a history of childhood maltreatment. So again, the association of maltreatment with depression uh, is uh, significant there compared to the uh, healthy control populations. But we have these four uh, categories now, depressed patients uh, with and without maltreatment, healthy controls with and without 
uh, maltreatment. And so we looked at the cognitive um, functioning of these patients uh, associated with these particular uh, categories. And we found some interesting results. So when we looked at the um, four categories, uh, it turns out that only the depressed patients with a history of childhood maltreatment seem to have clear cognitive deficits compared to the healthy control uh, individuals. Then in fact, the uh, patients um, that did not have childhood maltreatment were much closer and not statistically different from the healthy control um, sample. And this was true uh, looking at the global cognitive score, the neurocognitive index. It uh, was true for uh, composite memory and also for uh, processing speed. So, um, uh, so this is very interesting because it appears that it was the presence of childhood maltreatment that seems to be more related to the cognitive deficits found in depression than the actual diagnosis because the um, depressed patients without maltreatment seem to have relatively preserved cognitive functioning. So this illustrates the importance of childhood maltreatment in our patients with depression. We also look at post-treatment in the patients who were remitted from depression. In other words, their scores after 16 weeks were in the normal range in the madras, um, 10 or less. And what we found was that, again, um, the uh, cognition improved in working memory and processing speed from baseline through the week 16 in all the patients. However, by the end of treatment in these remitted patients who were no longer depressed, only the patients uh, who had a history of childhood maltreatment continued to have cognitive deficits relative to the healthy controls. And the um, patients without a history of maltreatment, again, not statistically significant uh, from the healthy controls. So again, we recognize that some patients do have cognitive deficits even in remission uh, after treatment, but it appears that it's the presence of childhood maltreatment that may mediate that association. Now, we also looked at um, hippocampal volume, of course, uh, very important in terms of uh, uh, looking at cognition. And there, we did not find any significant differences between the depressed group and the uh, healthy control group in terms of the hippocampal volumes, um, which um, uh, um, uh, is um, in, uh, doesn't goes against some of the positive findings in other studies. However, when we grouped the healthy controls and the patients together, again, what we found was this association with childhood maltreatment. That in the um, in the people who had a history of childhood maltreatment, the um, hippocampal volume was lower uh, than in those that did not have a history of maltreatment in both left and right hippocampus, and um, primarily in those who had a history of childhood sexual abuse. So again, this was independent of the diagnosis. Uh, this was just uh, in the total group, uh, both healthy and depressed patients, where it was really the history of childhood maltreatment that seemed to be associated with lower hippocampal volumes. So, I think, uh, again, just to summarize in terms of those findings, which I think are, are very important in terms of our understanding of cognitive deficits and depression, that childhood maltreatment was significantly associated with childhood, uh, with cognitive dysfunction in both acute and in remitted adults with uh, depression. That um, especially childhood sexual abuse is associated with smaller hippocampal volume, whether or not people were clinically depressed and that we really should be looking carefully at maltreatment history in future studies of cognition in depression because of this, what seems like a strong association uh, between maltreatment. And as clinicians, we should be alerted in our patients with a history of childhood maltreatment that they are at higher risk of having cognitive deficits 
both while they're depressed and perhaps even uh, after uh, their other symptoms have gotten better. So that's um, uh, you know looking at some of the neuropsychological um, findings in depression. But of course, even with our relatively simple battery, you know, 20 to 25 minutes is probably too long of a test to use routinely in busy clinical practices. And so I was fortunate to be part of an international uh, group called Think, uh, which uh, looked at uh, cognition in depression. And uh, along with uh, the lead investigator, uh, Professor Roger McIntyre from uh, Toronto, we developed a very simple cognitive screener called Thinkit uh, that um, involves only four simple tests, digit symbol substitution test, choice reaction time, trail making B test, and a one back memory test. And this is, uh, these, these tests are actually um, done on a tablet device, like an iPad or an Android tablet. Each of these tests actually takes under two minutes. So the entire um, screening uh, battery is, can be done under 15 minutes and can be completed by the patient themselves. And so this is a very um, uh, simple and feasible uh, cognitive test uh, that you can use in your clinical practice. And it's available for free download at the uh, think.progress.im uh, website. So uh, please have a look at that. Uh, we validated the Think It uh, study in a sample of uh, patients with depression and found that almost half performed one standard deviation or more below the mean for healthy control individuals. So it did seem to um, identify cognitive problems in uh, depression. And particularly important in clinical care, it seems sensitive to change with treatment. So you can use it to uh, determine if patients are improving uh, and back to um, uh, hopefully baseline in terms of their uh, cognitive functioning uh, with treatment. Okay, well, what about self-report measures? Because we said that these are also very uh, more feasible to use in a busy uh, clinical practice. Uh, well, several uh, cognitive questionnaires have been validated specifically in depression. And uh, I've been fortunate to uh, have been involved in two of these um, validations. One is with uh, neuropsychologist Grant Iverson, the British Columbia Cognitive Complaints Inventory, a very simple uh, questionnaire, only six items, and um, uh, validated in a sample of uh, patients with uh, depression and healthy controls as well as the uh, perceived deficits questionnaire specifically for depression that was modified from one developed for multiple sclerosis, but has uh, 20 items in the main uh, questionnaire, but a simpler five item version uh, is also available. Again, validated in a large number of uh, people with depression and healthy controls. Uh, Maurizio Fava also has one. Uh, the uh, Cognitive and Physical Functioning Questionnaire developed at the uh, Mass General Ho Massachusetts General Hospital. Again, seven items. Um, th this scale also uh, looks at cognition as well as motivation, alertness, and energy. Uh, certainly the uh, BCCCI and the PDQ can be uh, found at uh, my website, uh, raymondlam.ca, um, and uh, available for uh, clinical use. This is just uh, to show the uh, PDQ-5, uh, very simple five items, uh, very easy to rate, uh, takes less than two minutes uh, or less to complete. You add up the scores, the higher the score, the greater are the number of cognitive complaints and uh, cognitive uh, problems that a patient is subjectively experiencing. Uh, this really just shows the association of um, a, a cognitive measure like the, um, uh, like the PDQ-5. Along here is the total score. Again, as the score increases, you have more cognitive complaints uh, in people with depression. And along the uh, y-axis is the Sheehan Disability Scale Functional Impairment Score. Again, the higher the score, the greater is the functional impairment. And this just shows the nice relationship 
between the cognitive score as cognitive dysfunction increases, the functional impairment also uh, increases. And again, this relationship seems independent of the severity of depression. So both cognitive dysfunction and depression severity were both independently predictors of functional impairment. Well, what about treatments? Because we have a lot of different types of treatments for um, major depressive disorder. And now we're starting to recognize that some treatments may be better for the cognitive deficits than others. And that's important when we're looking at treatments. Uh, I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit about a very simple cognitive test called the digit symbol substitution test. Uh, widely used test of processing speed, uh, global cognition, takes only a couple of minutes to do. And what you do is you uh, have a look at the numbers here and the associated symbols, and you simply put down the symbol that's associated with the uh, proper number. So two, you put in this symbol here. For one, you put in this symbol here, et cetera, et cetera. Get a bit of practice. And then you um, try to do as many simple, uh, complete as many symbols as you can in 90 seconds. So this is a wonderful global test because it assesses attention. You need to att be attention attentive to uh, do this, uh, this uh, test. It measures psychomotor speed because there's, it's timed. And it measures executive functioning because you have to go back and forth between the table and uh, completing the uh, symbols here. So it's a very, it's widely used, probably the most widely used test of cognitive uh, functioning uh, in, uh, in the literature. And it's well known that people with depression do poorly on the DSST compared to control subjects. Well, uh, my colleague Bernhard Bonn um, in Germany uh, conducted uh, a network meta-analysis looking at all of the studies of antidepressant treatment assessing cognitive change as assessed by the digit symbol substitution test. And there they found a very interesting findings. This is the effect size, the difference, um, the improvement in the DSST following treatment in depressed patients. The higher the bar, the greater is the improvement in the DSST. The lower the bar, the greater is the worsening uh, on the DSST following treatment. And you can see that some medications like MAOIs and tricyclic antidepressants are actually associated with worsening on this cognitive test. And that may be because of the anticholinergic properties, which we know uh, impair cognitive function. But here uh, you can see that SSRIs were fairly neutral in their effect, not statistically significant uh, in this cognitive test, whereas SNRIs did seem to show positive benefit following treatment, although this was not statistically significant in this network meta-analysis. Only vortioxetine, the multimodal antidepressant, showed clear improvement in cognition following treatment as assessed by the DSST. And this just shows the individual antidepressants that were assessed uh, in this network meta-analysis. So I think this is some of the evidence which now suggests that some medications may be better for the cognitive deficit seen in depression than others. And in particular, vortioxetine and possibly the uh, SNRI medications. Um, in terms of looking at vortioxetine, this uh, study, this is actually a Canadian study done by a colleague of mine, Pratap Choka, where they um, looked at uh, open label treatment with vortioxetine, 10 to 20 milligrams over a year's time in people who are actually working um, and depressed. And what they found in this uh, group of almost 200 patients was a clear association between the subjective cognitive complaints that patients had and the change in their work functioning as assessed by the work limitations questionnaire. So that the greater the, imp the improvement in terms of their subjective cognition, the greater was their improvement in work functioning. And this was again, independent of the improvement in disease severity as measured by the 
uh, quids SR symptom scale. So again, I think showing the importance of making sure that cognitive improvement occurs uh, in terms of its effect on functioning. Uh, we also looked at, um, uh, uh, now this was a subjective uh, scale of uh, cognition. And so we also looked at the relationship between uh, neuropsychological testing and occupational functioning in employed patients who are being treated for depression. And we did, a, again, a simple study where we took um, about 40 patients with uh, depression who were still working either part-time or full-time while they were depressed and while they were being treated for depression. And we treated them with desvenlafaxine and SNRI antidepressant 50 to 100 milligrams over the course of eight weeks. And we tested them before and after treatment using the CNS Vital Signs uh, computerized test battery. We also looked at um, assessments of occupational functioning as well as uh, symptom measures and then uh, cognitive functioning um, as well, again, uh, using the CNS Vital Signs uh, computerized battery. And what we found was, again, not surprising that patients improved from baseline here in the gray. Um, they improved following treatment in purple on all measures of the uh, cognitive test battery. Uh, whether it was the global neurocognitive index or on every um, uh, domain of uh, cognition assessed by the CNS vital signs uh, computerized battery. Again, no surprise there. Um, you know, many studies have shown that antidepressants improve cognition, particularly SNRI uh, antidepressants. But we were interested in whether improvement in cognition uh, led to greater improvement in functioning. And because this was an open study uh, with no placebo control, we decided to only look at the people who had substantial benefit in cognition. And we defined that as people who improved on the uh, neurocognitive index by at least one standard deviation um, uh, of the mean. Most uh, uh, people would agree that that is a clear improvement in cognition. And what we found was that in the patients who improved um, that, uh, who showed clear improvement in cognition, and that was about a third of the patients in our group of uh, 36 patients, that they had, um, of course, you know, uh, by definition, they had improvement in their cognition, but also they had more benefit on symptom scales like the MADRAS and the subjective uh, QUIDS SR. Uh, compared to the people who did not have that degree of cognitive uh, improvement. We also found that the uh, people who had that degree of cognitive uh, improvement had greater improvement in work functioning as assessed by our um, LEAPS work questionnaire and by the health uh, and work performance questionnaire, the gold standard questionnaire um, looking at work productivity. And uh, so what this shows is that improvement in cognition leads to greater improvement in functioning. And again, showing that importance of cognition to functioning and why we should really make sure that our patients improve in cognition uh, to ensure that they have optimal uh, functional recovery. Um, that's why in our CANMAT depression guidelines, we actually focus on clinical dimensions that might be important in terms of treatment selection. And we identified cognitive dysfunction as one of those clinical dimensions, more important than some of the subtypes like melancholic or atypical depression. And here, when we summarize the evidence, we found, again, uh, there was good evidence that vortioxetine may be a little better than other antidepressants in terms of that um, of addressing cognitive dysfunction. We found second uh, level two evidence that um, SS or, uh, SNRIs like deloxetine, NRIs like uh, bupropion, and possibly SSRIs. But uh, again, these were studies only looking at comparisons um, against placebo and not necessarily head-to-head -head comparisons as seen with these um, other uh, medications. 
And there was a little, there was less, a lower quality evidence that meclobamide uh, may be uh, helpful as well. So again, when we're looking at treating cognitive dysfunction in depression, we may want to look at uh, using medications like bordeoxetine and SNRI um, or NRI antidepressants. So uh, just to summarize uh, what we've talked about uh, over the course of this uh, talk, uh, depressive symptoms uh, cause significant impairment in functioning, which is why depression is so important to the individual and to society, uh, that cognitive dysfunction is a major mediator of functional impairment uh, in our patients, and that in particular, childhood maltreatment may be a very important mediator of some of the cognitive deficits that we see in depression. And that's why monitoring cognitive symptoms is so important during our treatment, making sure that our patients can optimize their functional recovery by making sure they don't have residual cognitive deficits, even if other symptoms of depression improve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond, for your very important uh, talk. You, you, you covered the whole, the whole field in a very rough way. Uh, we have uh, two questions, but first, let me, uh, uh, let me accept the privilege of the host and ask you, uh, do we have any idea how childhood uh, maltreatment uh, mediates? What's the mechanism? through which uh, childhood abuse mediates cognitive impairment in later life? Uh, we, we have uh, certainly um, a lot of, uh, of uh, hypotheses and probably the, the main hypothesis is through uh, impaired immune uh, functioning uh, through and through um, you know, disturbances in uh, you know, cortisol, the HPA uh, axis uh, level. Um, you know, uh, certainly emerging studies now showing uh, the impact of uh, particularly chronic stressors on uh, immune functioning and neuroimmune functioning. And the, um, of course, the impact of, uh, of uh, cortisol on things like hippocampal atrophy. And so I think that's um, one of the key hypotheses um, for the um, mediating effect of, uh, of childhood maltreatment uh, as perhaps even a scar effect um, where childhood maltreatment leads to uh, increased uh, cortisol, which leads to hippocampal um, uh, atrophy, uh, decreased volume loss or increased volume loss and cognitive deficits, which then are magnified when people become depressed. So we have two questions. Uh, are the cognitive deficits that are related to depression irreversible when depression is treated? I think you more or less answer that, but yeah. So, so, let's, so that's let's a, that, but that's a very good question, and it's probably a more complex question than um, you know than we think, because again, generally speaking, people's cognition improves with uh, improvement of the depression. But we now know many studies show that there are still cognitive deficits that can be demonstrated in groups of people even in remission, like our study uh, showed. What's not clear is the reason for that cognitive deficit. Was it pre-existing cognitive deficit before they were treated, for example? Um, you know, is it related to a scar effect like childhood maltreatment um, you know, in people with uh, depression? And so I think that's where we're at right now. We need to do more longitudinal studies at baseline and following um, you know, treatment to really um, determine who has cognitive deficits and what, um, you know, whether those are remediable um, with, uh, with treatment. Of course, for, with this talk, I only talked about antidepressant treatment, but we know there are other treatments uh, focused on cognitive dysfunction. For example, cognitive remediation is a, a, a well-established uh, psychological treatment that focuses to be helpful in uh, people with schizophrenia and now emerging evidence that it's also helpful in people with depression. So we may be able to target some of the cognitive dysfunction using different types of treatment. And uh, the second question is how to differentiate between cognitive dysfunction 
of uh, mild cognitive impairment and early phase of dementia versus early onset dementia and COVID deaths seen in depressive uh, elderly people. Uh, well, that's <laughs> that's a bit that's tricky. It. And, On and the other hand, if I had the answer that... to that, I'd win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so On the... the other hand, can we speculate that early childhood traumatization is risk factor for cognitive dysfunction, not just in depression, but also in dementia? I think that's a that's a good question, and um, you know I'm not sure about the literature on that. That that's actually a very good question uh, as to whether that uh, that might be uh, a factor uh, in terms of uh, of dementia. Um, of course, there there are no good tests that can easily differentiate between depression, uh, MCI, and uh, and and Alzheimer's. Um, you know, it's really you know kind of following uh, patients, making sure you treat what is treatable. And um, uh, you know, again, the importance though of monitoring cognition through uh, any uh, any treatment. Peter, it's your your turn. So thank you very much. Uh, very kind of you. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, I, I was I was. <laughs> oh. Uh, I, I was addressing yeah, Peter, Peter Morozov. Oh, addressing, <laughs> having a question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Peter Fox, oh, I, they, they but if you have, But you. if you find yeah. a question. I have, I okay. have. I was listening to your talk uh, quite intensively. So uh, I think that um, I find it very interesting that you even found effects of antidepressants, which are clearly, uh, you know, uh, actually showing an advantage um, looking at cognitive dysfunction. On the other hand, I was wondering whether you would, if you actually add on or sort of uh, combine different methods, whether you can reach either different groups or you can have an additional effect. Maybe you can comment on that when you add psychotherapy or cognitive remediation to yeah. antidepressants. Yeah, a very good question, uh, Peter. And again, you know, I, I wish we had clear uh, answers. When I was talking about the differences between antidepressants, of course, those are in studies where we just take an undifferentiated group of people with depression. So they're not actually studies you know, where we start with people who have cognitive dysfunction. And I think that's, that's really the next step, right? Is looking at, you know, can we identify people with cognitive dysfunction? Can, you know, are the treatments, you know, specific, right? For those people, right? We need to develop those treatments that target some of these, um, you know, what I call transdiagnostic um, clinical dimensions like cognition. So it's no, not surprising that some of the same, same treatments work uh, for schizophrenia and for and for depression, right? It's cognitive changes, and so I think that's where cognitive remediation, you know, may be very helpful. But but perhaps only if we look at the sample who start with cognitive dysfunction. So I think that's where where we need to go with our studies is to um, uh, take that group of people, not just an indifferentiated group of people who, um, com you know, have cognitive complaints. As a simple clinician, I would have a second question. My question would be, I mean, what is, what is your way of actually uh, tackling if a patient with depression, because usually we regard patients with depression not having cognitive deficits. We were wrong on that for over a hundred years. <laughs> Often my impression is that a lot of clinicians, they don't even think about this. So what would be one of your key questions to ask uh, to make sure that the patient has functionally relevant cognitive dysfunction? Yeah, I, I think the, the important thing, um, you know, I think is, is really um, executive functioning. Uh, because, um, you know, I think many clinicians um, recognize that, you know, concentration is impaired. And, and sometimes they assume it's just concentration and attention because they're so depressed. And so once their depression improves, then their concentration and attention uh, will improve. Whereas it's quite clear now that they also have problems with memory and, but it's executive functioning that's so important for our um, everyday uh, functioning. Uh, so asking about, you know, having trouble, you have trouble, you know, organizing things or with multitasking uh, or with, um, you know, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, making decisions. I think those are the types of things that are more related to everyday functioning. 
And you know, once you start recognizing that those are problems, then it, you, you start to um, realize it's not just concentration and attention uh, that's impaired in people with, uh, with depression. But what would you say? What would you ask? I mean, to concentrate is mean you're looking at the attention span, right? But I mean, what would you, I mean, looking at executive function, what, what would you ask? Uh, well, things like, um, you know, making making decisions in terms of, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, what what to buy at the, at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how often is that? Is that a, not just that you can't remember what you're going to buy, but uh, but, you know, making those decisions, um, you know, at work, uh, you know, being able to uh, you know, do more than one uh, task at a time or um, shifting your attention from one task to another. Um, you know, I think those are the sorts of things that, um, you know, can be done. But, but of course, that's where the utility of using a simple scale is helpful, yeah. right? Because then it um, you know, gives you a standardized way of assessing those kinds of cognitive complaints. Thank you. So, Peter, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think, I think my, my slides didn't get or got lost sharing or something. So I will provide you the uh, PDF of the slides uh, if you want to send them out to people. Uh, we, we we don't have such a, such a oh. mechanism. But if okay. you would like to to upload the slides in the WPA uh, web page, I think you you are more than welcome for this. So Peter, it's your turn to uh, introduce Peter Falkai. Oh my God! Well, well. Uh... It's a really uh, a great honor for me, a great privilege to introduce Professor Peter Falkai, who is uh, the president of the European Psychiatric Association and who is a chief of the very, very world famous clinic in Munich, uh, the Maxim Maximilian <laughs> University and, uh, and the clinic which is uh, lit sometimes by names like uh, Neil Preplin, like, uh, uh, like uh, Hans Hippius, whom I worked with some years and uh, I'm very proud. I'm very proud that my um, work, I have as close associate in my young, uh, in my time of when I work with the World Psychiatric, well, World Health Organization, with this clinic I visited a number of times I understand that it was uh, the real mech for the for the European and the world psychiatrist. And uh, uh, Professor Falca, I would like to say some words, not about his 800th publication, and he's very well known in different parts uh, of, of his career uh, by his work, but I would like uh, to talk about his, uh, uh, as a person who is really, uh, helped tremendously to the World Psychiatric Association, in the particular uh, to the people who need some help and assistance. And uh, the just one side, uh, we tried to translate the um, uh, book of the uh, anthology of German psychiatry into Russian. We tried to do it for five years because it it was very difficult to obtain the original language, uh, original text in, in German. Sometimes it was in the old uh, German type uh, typing, you know, which is uh, quite uh, difficult to, to find out, to translate, to adopt to uh, today's condition. Uh, Professor Falke, uh, you know, resolved our problem in two weeks. And I'm very proud to report that uh, practically all uh, anthology is translated into Russian. And I'm sure that next year, the whole Russian psychiatry received the whole text of the original uh, text from the classic of German psychiatry. I think it's a real jest, which we appreciate very much. And uh, you should know about it because it's a, it's a sign of the international spirit and to uh, help to psychiatrists in different parts of the world. So sorry to be so long and so emotional, but for me, it's a real honor to introduce Professor Falke, please. And thank you. Thank you. So topic, of course, topic, guidelines-based treatment of schizophrenia, which is essential and very interesting, please. Peter, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I have to say that 
I mean, to say the full truth, I mean, I received a very good vodka in return, which I enjoyed <laughs> drinking with my friends. So that is the whole story. So it is a friendship which is based on helping where we can. And I think yeah, that's a nice way. So uh, dear Peter, dear Costas, dear Raymond, thank you very much, first of all, for, intro, well, for uh, inviting me and uh, for giving me the possibility to give this talk. So I will share my slides. And uh, so, dear colleagues, um, it is interesting that when you listened to Raymond's uh, talk about cognitive dysfunction, depression, that I will focus on negative symptoms and cognition as well, but on another disorder. So obviously it is something which sort of uh, interests us clinicians a lot. So these are just my uh, conflicts of interest, you should know, but I don't think that they are of any interest because I'm not focusing on any specific medication. But what would I speak about? I'd like to give you a whole uh, view on that. So I'd like to start with schizophrenia and its prodromal states, then go to the first episode, multi-episode, and then focus on negative symptoms and hear specifically what can we do with pharmacotherapy. But we shouldn't forget, and this is something I've asked Raymond uh, about adding other things like psychotherapy or cognitive remediation. And interesting, there are little things looking at lifestyle modifications or interventions like diet and exercise. And then have a final thought about treatment resistance schizophrenia. So what is this prodromal schizophrenia? Well, um, I think there are different phases when we actually look for preventing psychosis, and we usually tend to forget this uh, because, I mean, there are means of primary prevention. I don't want to elude on that, but I mean, in the previous talk, we had trauma. We, had the, uh, we, we might have the question of obstructive complications and things like that. And actually, if we go into primary prevention, there are a lot of things we can do in order to prevent the development of mental illness. And if you think about cannabis uh, and related issues, I mean, that's the thing where primary prevention uh, comes in. But what can we do? So once we actually have people at an increased risk of developing psychoses, uh, what do we see? Well, we see a decline of global functioning. Often we see effective symptoms and basic symptoms. Well, basic symptoms basically are a mixture of negative symptoms, but which are actually regarded by the patients themselves as the problem. So what can you do? And uh, so a bit looking at the guidelines, which are scars, uh, we had some hope with fish oil for a while, and I show you a good, uh, well-controlled study uh, on that. Antidepressants obviously don't, antipsychotics don't work uh, in the way. It is interesting if we look at non-pharmacological interventions, CBT is the way to go. And I think there is some evidence if we combine CBT and antidepressants. Now, this is a large scale study by Mac uh, Goris, who actually, and I, I was, I have to say, a big believer, and I say it would be lovely just to give fish oil to the patients at an early stage of psychosis. But as you can see, placebo and the fish oil, there was no difference. And it's a large scale study. So we could say, at least for this uh, phase of psychosis, it's very unlikely. Um, that um, fish oil in its own will give us a, a good remedy. But what else do we do? So if we look, and I like this uh, paper, if it's older by Fusa Poli, um, just, you know, what do we do with patients? So focused interventions offered to subjects at high clinical risk, because usually people are a bit, you know, what should I do? So what do they do? Okay, if you look that, so I think we don't know, but CBT, obviously, the way to go for a third of the patients. Then CBT combined with antipsychotics, CBT with antidepressants, and the combination of all of that. And usually that is the answer that if we don't know exactly what to do, we combine everything with everything. <clears throat> but the question is, what does really help? 
And so they looked at the literature and did a, did a Cox regression, a last analysis, showing the association of each group of focused intervention with primary outcome. So primary outcome is not only reducing, uh, let's say, the symptomatology, but improving uh, functioning. And as you can see, here is overall transition days. That means that people then got worse and developed uh, psychosis. Um, and you can see here is CBT plus antidepressants. Here's a combination, CBT only and CBT and antipsychotics. So obviously, and it's quite interesting that the best outcome you have is CBT and antipsychotics. So, so, uh, so sorry, that's the worst one. So the best is CBT and antidepressants. So in a way, it's interesting that also we have this kind of impulse uh, by saying, look, um, it is a psychotic illness. Uh, obviously, it is not a good idea to actually add an antipsychotic uh, very early on. So um, I would say, yes, if you have a patient at this stage of the illness, and you don't have the possibility of giving CBT, then give an antidepressant only, it's even better than combining CBT and antipsychotic. Once you really have uh, psychotic symptoms, that is not a question. But overall, I would say best would be CBT and antidepressant. If there is no CBT available, even psychoeducation is a good mean. So I would then add um, cognitive remedy, uh, 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 psychoeducation and an antidepressant. So we started with primary uh, prevention, then went to secondary prevention, uh, and then go uh, once we really have psychotic um, uh, symptoms like uh, short um, episodes of positive symptoms, uh, acute psychotic symptoms, or uh, prodromal negative symptoms, what can we do there? Well, that is no question. At that stage, one, once you have definitive psychotic symptoms, you should add an antipsychotic. And I personally like to add that also because of the long-term outcome, I would think about even putting the patients on a long-acting antipsychotic. Why? Because if you keep a stable level of an antipsychotic, the likeliness that the patient won't relapse, we know that from several studies, is much uh, more reduced than if you give oral antipsychotic and then patients might discontinue because you know of the illness and so forth. And then you have a course which is more unfavorable. Well, we don't know about adding antidepressants. I usually thought for a long time lithium and anticonvulsants are good, but obviously antipsychotics, uh, there is evidence for that. If we look at non-pharmacological interventions, CBT is obviously helpful. Well, I think that exercise is coming, at least studies we are currently doing, hopefully give some results, uh, giving a cl clear direction. And then combining CBT and antipsychotics that not clear from the literature so far. But I think you don't do anything wrong if you combine it in an individual patient, but you should make sure that you give an antipsychotic. So once you have psychotic symptoms, actually use a medication there. And then we go from primary, secondary, we go to uh, tertiary prevention that actually sort of preventing that the development of the illness is getting worse. So it goes into a stage of residual symptoms where you have negative symptoms and cognitive dysfunction. Uh, and there is no questions. We give antipsychotics. Uh, uh, certainly there is a good evidence for individual psychotherapy, for family interventions, and for exercise. What about combination treatments? And I think there are some interesting studies um, like the RACE study where they combined individual family-based and antipsychotic and supported employment, and it shows a better uh, functional outcome. Therefore, I think once you reached a clear face of psychotic illness, you should actually try to combine different ways which work, not only antipsychotics, whatever is possible for psychotherapy and supported employment. There's good evidence for antipsychotic and CBT. And there is, I think at the moment, 
limited, but hopefully by mid of next year, we have a uh, five center uh, study large enough to tell you whether that actually gives a clear effect on cognition. Further issues to look at are somatic comorbidities, uh, psychiatric comorbidities, and partial and non-remission. And I think this is very important. I think we should have the goal of recovery. So the concept of recovery, which it took a while uh, to be accepted within psychiatry, I think it's important because what does it mean? It means that as a patient, you will cope with your illness, even if you have residual symptoms. And I think that's a much easier concept than full remission or just uh, that improvement of symptoms. So it's a combination of the um, expectancy of the patient on one side and what we can really reach with our means, including pharmaco and psychotherapy. So that was prodromal psychosis. It's just, uh, I think that, you know, the more we look into uh, the uh, beginning of psychosis, it's important that we actually try to treat the different stages of that. So what about first episode schizophrenia? Well, uh, I'm just um, quoting out of the um, uh, German guideline on schizophrenia, which was published end of 2019. So currently summarizes the literature quite well. Well, it is uh, nothing to uh, think about. We recommend offering pharmacological treatment with an antipsychotic as a monotherapy with the goal to reduce psychotic symptoms. And this is an A recommendation. That means also there is a lot of discussion about the use of antipsychotics. I don't think that in first episode psychosis, you should discuss it. You should actually offer it to the patient and hopefully he takes that. So during the acute phase, we recommend reviewing and documenting the psychopathological findings at appropriate intervals. Also, I think this is gen, uh, good clinical practice. I think it's important just to nail down. I mean, that was something Jay asked Gray. I mean, what is the question? And, and, and how can you actually pinpoint down whether your patients gets better? And they usually have simple questions like, you know, what would you say your psychotic symptoms are? If they're really severe, they are 10. If there's nothing, it's zero. So where are you? And then you just document that from week to week you see the patient. So this is acute phase. What about first episode? Again, in first episode, schizophrenia recommend offering antipsychotic. It's A, and depending on the psychopathology treatment setting and patient references, um, may consider waiting a few days. Well, that's another discussion is, should you immediately treat the patient or should you wait for a few days? Well, I would say, that in the current situation and the critical uh, um, discussion we had about um, starting with antipsychotic, it's fine. If you're not sure about the diagnosis, you should wait. But if you're sure about the diagnosis, you should uh, start away. Now, uh, if we actually go for response or recovery, uh, I think it's important that you actually define that. And we have nailed down that the response status should be defined after two weeks, latest after four weeks by using suitable scales. Uh, even a CGI is fine and, you know, it gives you a clear signal. Um, and in the case of lack of response, despite adequate dosing and after excluding secondary cause, we recommend offering the patient a switch to an antipsychotic, which is different receptor profile. So obviously you start with an antipsychotic and you document if it works. And if it doesn't work, then change to one with a different receptor profile. So if you summarize that, what do you actually do in first um, a diagnosis of schizophrenia? Uh, watchful waiting until the diagnosis is uh, established. I mean, something we clinicians do anyway. Begin antipsychotic monotherapy. Again, I mean, we could discuss that later on once people like to do that. Uh, whether you should, we should stay with uh, monotherapy, at least if you look at the literature. That has nothing to do with daily clinical practice. Monotherapy should be regarded first choice and then specific CBT edit. And for that evidence is A. So after response two to four weeks, rather two than four weeks. So there's good data suggesting that is actually two weeks when you can decide to change medication. Response sh status should be 
um, determined, responds, no use, a relapse prevention. And then uh, that question is how to continue. And if you have a non-response, switch to an antipsychotic. But it's interesting. I think that, you know, make a decision here. We have a clinical decision, switch to an antipsychotic. It's between A and a, let's say, clinical decision. So overall, I would say uh, there is a clear way of starting with an antipsychotic once the diagnosis is um, installed at CBT and after two weeks, actually decide how to pursue from here. So this is first step. So we started with prodromal psychosis. And I think, again, there are certain phases to look at preventive measures, starting with just waiting until, you know, really adding an antipsychotic once you uh, approach uh, towards the first episode. We spoke about first episode psychosis. I think there is no question we should start once a diagnosis is, end, uh, is, is actually established with antipsychotics at CBT and then look at the sort of uh, further um, uh, things to be done. So what about multi-episode schizophrenia? So, I mean, first of all, I think we need to prevent the first relapse. How can we do that? I think even if this is under discussion and I don't show data for that here, I think long-acting antipsychotics is the easiest way to actually prevent, uh, even in first episode, the next relapse. But once we have relapses, what do we actually do? Well, I would say uh, it's important to actually, again, uh, look for relapse prevention and early warning signs. That's a good strategy to actually prevent the next relapse. But overall, how do we treat recurrent episodes? Well, after an individual risk-benefit evaluation has been uh, performed, we recommend uh, offering people with schizophrenia, first episode and multi-episode antipsychotic treatment for relapse prevention. That's an A, okay? Um, so again, for relapse prevention, we recommend offering uh, the antipsychotics that has already resulted in a good treatment response, which is an A, so that's no question. When choosing the antipsychotic for relapse prevention, we recommend considering the service user's preferences and previous experiences, as well as the different risk of side effects, such as tardive dyskinesia and so forth. For that, there is no good evidence. This is good clinical practice. And it just shows you that there is now a discussion which goes away, away from, um, let's say, the pure evidence and then includes the patient's perspective and the relative's perspectives, which is good. But it needs to be made clear that there is good evidence. And I think that in the core, we should actually follow the evidence. OK, so you could say, fine. So we can treat, let's say, prodromal psychosis, we can treat first episode schizophrenia and multi episode schizophrenia. Where's the problem here? Well, the problem is that there are, let's say, about half of the patients showing a acceptable outcome, as you can see. So schizophrenia is comparable to bipolar disorder and major depression. And you can see that after a, an episode or between the relapses as outlined in these first two lines, you could see that there are no residual symptoms. So the patients, once they are not acutely ill, they are in a good functional condition. But what about the other half of the patients? And that's the problem, that in between the episodes, you either have let's say, remaining residual symptoms, which are negative symptoms and cognitive disorder, or even worse, it's an increase over time, and that's a substantial number of patients. And this is where the problem starts. The problem actually starts that if we actually look at what is the percentage of people who then reach recovery in schizophrenia, it's still a fifth of the patients and even less. And that's true for the last uh, 100 years. So actually introducing antipsychotics has helped a lot, but still that seem to be that residual symptoms reduce the likeliness for a full functional outcome. Now, what is the basis of that for this impaired outcome? Well, these are residual treatment refractory symptoms especially cognitive dysfunction and negative symptoms. And the question is, 
what on else, what, what on earth can we do there? So what can we actually do in order to improve um, especially cognitive dysfunction? Well, this is an overview, which I sort of uh, modified according to uh, Phil Harvey's uh, slide. So actually, if you look at what mechanisms has been actually tested in order to improve cognitive impairment, well, we know nicotinic antagonist, adrenergic agonist, modafinil amphetamine, cholinesterase uh, uh, inhibitors. I remember the studies and I thought, oh, this would be neat, right? Also, you have a cholinergic deficit, so you could improve on that, they failed. Empikines, then we had the whole sort of gluso, uh, glycoserine, deserine, and so forth failed. Histamine receptor antagonists, uh, pregnenolone, um, GABA antagonists, and PDE inhibitors. So I think there is a long range of studies trying to improve that. And uh, I think there is one, I think, interesting combined, which is now in phase three. It's a glycine transporter A inhibitor. Why? What is so special about this? Well, we know that schizophrenia is said to have a NNDA receptor hyperfunction. And NNDA receptor function is fundamental for cognition. So glycine is an essential co-activator of the NNDA receptor. And so if you inhibit or uh, the glyce, gly, glycine 2 uh, transporters increases glycine concentration in the synaptic graph, and that leads to normalization of NMDAR receptors. So that's the theory behind it. And the question is, does it work? Well, let's say in phase two, um, that was published uh, first author, uh, Wolfgang Fleischhacker, just recently. And what did they show? Well they actually could show that if you look at uh, the different um, dosages of this compound, two milligram, five milligram, 10 milligram, 25 milligrams, you can see there is one, uh, it's the 10 milligram dose, the green one, which actually shows, including into the study, six weeks, 12 weeks, you can see a quite significant improvement of cognitive dysfunction. So in phase three, uh, and we are currently including patients in this trial. Uh, we want to see, you know, it's a large scale study, whether um, uh, this compound is really helpful to reduce, well, I wouldn't say dissolve, but hopefully reduce cognitive dysfunction in schizophrenia. But the question is, is that all we can do? I mean, I've shown you that we've tried a lot of things and actually, tackle this issue. So the question is, is there anything else we can do beside pharmacotherapy? Because I mean, waiting for uh, the uh, study to be finished and things like that until then, the question is what will we do? Well, and the question is that we actually know that psychotherapy seem to do something, especially if you take a very severe the so-called treatment resistant schizophrenia group. And um, CBT works. Interestingly, we have to say, even in treatment resistant schizophrenia, more in positives than in negative symptoms. But are there other things you can do and your patients do anyway? And it's interesting that there are now mediation, media, uh, meditation based mind body therapies for negative symptoms. Well, usually psychiatrists will say, what a nonsense. Well, it is not. Because if you actually look at three of those, yoga, tai chi, and mindfulness, uh, you find quite specific effects on negative symptoms. So usually, once I have read this study, I thought, well, just ask our patients whether they do yoga, and it's good. So it's improving the negative symptoms. Tai chi, not so much, and mindfulness does. So actually, the mindfulness uh, we introduce in our uh, third and fourth wave of psychotherapy might, uh, might work on negative symptoms. It's interesting that positive symptoms, again, is another story. So yoga works, but Tai Chi doesn't work and mindfulness doesn't work. Well, if you think about it, it makes sense that you find this differentiation. 
So overall, I would say yes. So if your patients like to do Tai Chi or yoga or mindfulness, support them. That will improve the negative symptoms. What about cognitive remediation? This is always thought to be one of those things which work, but we don't know. Well, actually, it does work uh, well in psychosis. And the question is really, does it work in negative symptoms? And this is a quite nice study published in 2019, where they looked at the different domains of the sun scale. So the experimental symptoms were consisted of abolition, apathy, and anhedonia and asociality. So it's the four of the five A's. So obviously there was negative symptoms and the expressive symptoms is affective flattening, blunted effect and allogia. So if we actually look at experimental, right? You can see that cognitive remediation uh, really works combined to the, uh, let's say, control condition. And then we look at the uh, expressive, again, we have the same. But there is something else which I wanted to allude to you. If we actually look at the sun's apathy scale and we compare those patients who take oral antipsychotics compared to those who get injectable ones, that this effect is more clearly in the group of the uh, patients receiving injectable uh, antipsychotics. So indeed, is, as pointed out previously, in the early stages of psychosis, even prodromal ones, but certainly at the first episodes, we should make sure that our patients receive the best possible antipsychotic coverage, which is actually based on the uh, on cognitive, uh, on, on uh, long-acting antipsychotics. What about lifestyle interventions and negative symptoms? Well, you will say, what is this? I mean, you know, we give medication, we do psychotherapy. Why do we actually need to change the lifestyle of our patients with schizophrenia? Well, this is, I think, a very nice, um, a paper by the Lancet Commission led by uh, Joe Firth. Uh, and let's look here. Here we have the different uh, illnesses, which is major depression, uh, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. And they looked at alcohol, tobacco use, physical activities, sedentary behavior, poor diet, and poor sleep. And I just like to focus on two. One is Look, look at physical activity and sedentary behavior. So patients with schizophrenia, the majority of patients do not meet physical activity guidelines, whatever that means, but uh, patients are sedentary for about 11 hours per day. So there's not a lot left actually to be active, right? And in addition, if you look at the diet, uh, patients um, actually, uh, consume around 400 calories more than the general population per day. Well, it's like a, um, you know, a whole chocolate, uh, chocolate bar you eat. This is like 400 calories. So you do that every day on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, actually, can we see that in their diet? Yes, we can. So we actually look by different patients, unipolar depression, bipolar uh, disorder, and schizophrenia. And you can see, especially in patients with schizophrenia, if we actually uh, look at the fats, there is a significant intake compared to healthy people. Uh, what about carbohydrates? Again, we have a significant increase. So we have a problem here. So beside the illness, I think that the illness and the negative symptoms actually lead to this unhealthy lifestyle. We know that. But what can we do about this? Well, I think it's important to actually uh, open this to the patient. Tell him that, you know, there is overweight. We shouldn't forget about the antipsychotics. There is certainly uh, too much sedentary. And so both of these, so diet and sedentary, should be pursued. We can't change this immediately, uh, but this is a long-term endeavor. And for that, we need to actually include the carers in this cycle. And we actually include our, need to include ourselves. 
what should be done? Well, they usually show the stride study. Why? Because people with quite a significant uh, BMI were included. So those ones who really needed some treatment. And, and, and what is the basis of that? And that, that is possibly easier than one thinks. It's obviously not enough uh, to actually tell people to do that, but you need to look at different things. And diet, usually say an apple a day, for instance, physical activity, 15 minutes a day of brisk walking and sleep. So not too much, but sleep regularly. So these are three things which need to come together. What happens if you actually, actually people go into such a treatment program? Well, the weight loss they have is not enormous, like three kilograms. So you could see what, what should we bother about? This? Well, we should, because actually, as you can see, all the other parameters improve. So it's the lipids, it's uh, glucose and it's uh, blood pressure and so forth. Why is this important? Well, it's important because we know that people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder and depression, but especially with schizophrenia have reduced life expectancy by roughly 10 years. And you could say it's suicidality, sure. It's medication, sure. But all of that leads to a certain lifestyle and that leads again to a somatic problem. And actually, if you want to tackle that, you need to have a long-term idea of what to do. Now, you could say, fine, uh, but what about? So diet, I said, just watch it and you know, make a point that it would be good that people actually watch their diet. So what about exercise? Well, a lot of people don't like this part of the talk because they say it's you know too much strength. But um, do, does physical exercise help in negative symptoms? And here we have a uh, meta-analysis, a recent one, as you can see, ending up with 17 controlled studies, um, which actually give us an answer. And here is the answer for that. Um, if we actually look at aerobic exercise, including one of our first studies there, you can see overall you have a significant effect on negative symptoms. Well, you can see there is an overlay. So you have studies which show a clear cut effect as here, but you see studies which are not significant. What does it mean? Well, it means that overall, um, exercise like all these measures don't tackle 100% of the patients you will actually it will meet about 50% of that but still an easy message uh, is required easy message means 50 minutes a day of brisk walking five times a week is enough to actually change your physical health so it's not a lot so aerobic exercise that means not uh, putting the strengths too much. So if you look at non-aerobic exercise, that's not that effective. So overall, keeping within the aerobic zone. That's fine. So overall, diet and exercise is fine too. And if you look at the distribution of the studies, looking at the funnel plots, that's fine too. But how does it work and, and what is it? And this is one of our studies which we performed waiting now for exercise three, this is exercise two, what did we do? We have asked patients with multi-episode schizophrenia to do indoor cycling three times a week, 30 minutes. And we compared them with healthy people who actually then did on indoor cycling. And the interesting thing is because we thought that not only exercise in itself, but we should give that a cognitive stimulus in addition because exercise stresses the brain. And if you want to have a functional improvement, you need to give a stimulus to the brain, some cognitive food. So what we did, we added after six weeks, cognitive remediation in the schizophrenia group. In the healthy people we had, again, after six weeks, we added cognitive remediation and we had a control group of patients with schizophrenia. And after six weeks doing table football, um, they received cognitive remediation. And the hypothesis was clearly that in the first arm where you combined 
exercise with cognitive remediation would have the best functional outcome. And as you can see, here we had endurance training and cognitive remediation. We entered the study. This is after six weeks. This is after three months. And we look at global functioning, a very simple measure. We look at social adjustment and we look for cognition. And you can see that there is a significant improvement in global functioning and an improvement in social uh, adjustment if you look at household, leisure, and overall. And if you actually look at the table soccer group, so those guys who actually moved, but not their big muscle groups, you can see actually there was no change. So obviously exercise plus cognitive remediation makes this uh, a change because as you can see, there is some effect of cognition because people entered cognitive remediation. So overall, I think it's important again, as we discussed several times to combine. So have sufficient antipsychotic treatment, have psychotherapy. And if you think about lifestyle modification, I would say add exercise, for instance, to cognitive remediation. And if you like to read a nice paper, which was just came out by Galderisi, by Silvana, um, and they, you know, looked at everything, how to measure negative symptoms. That's the first paper. And the second paper they published is on uh, what are the means you can treat with. And actually, they included exercise can be considered for persons suffering from negative symptoms as part of an integrated treatment plan, also aiming at improving physical health. They gave it only a C. So we need to add better data to go up to B and A. So uh, just a few words to treatment resistant schizophrenia, because we started with prodromal first episode, multi-episode. And I always say we shouldn't forget those people who have the worst outcome. And there is a percentage of patients having that. So if there is no treatment response, which is just not to increase antipsychotic doses above the approved range, that's an important thing, but actually, um, change to an antipsychotic we call um, uh, clozapine. So I think my plea would be once you tried several antipsychotics, and that's my final slide there, you start with an antipsychotic in monotherapy, that's fine. After two weeks, you change to an anti antipsychotic again in monotherapy, no change, then you change to clozapine. So I think it's important that you keep that. And if that is not working, you have combinations and ECT. But I think it's important to outline, usually people then combine in the beginning. So I would really recommend rather change to an antipsychotic with a different profile and then go to uh, clozapine in the next step. So I'd like, as one of my last few slides, I think I have two more, this one and one, one another one. Um, I like the staging model. There are several staging models around, but I like the one by um, uh, Pat McGorry, who then starts and saying, you know, people with an increased risk of psychosis. So what should we do here? And here you can see the uh, fatty acids and especially the, the fish oil. And then what about the next phase where you have ultra right, a higher risk? Again, you can see here uh, just uh, uh, psychoeducation. And as we said, rather than antidepressant, and they added an atypical antipsychotic. First episode, immediately you will say, well, we want antipsychotic. And then incomplete remission, uh, recurrence of relapse. You have all the things we discussed and at the end, close up here. And I think it shows you that we have to look at what stages are the patients and uh, at what phase of the illness they are. So this is the summary and the conclusion. Um, for me, no question. I mean, looking at the treatment of people with schizophrenia, we need to aim at recovery, which clearly is the goal that people can actually cope with their symptoms. This implies treating psychotic symptoms, but also all other aspects of the disorder that have an impact on people's real life needs, work skills, interpersonal relationships, everyday life activities. 
which is often forgotten. So once they have no positive symptoms, that's fine. It's not enough. To be treated are therefore negative symptoms, cognitive dysfunction, improve resilience, and reduce internalized stigma. So the treatment provision should be tailored to the needs of the patient and the stage of the disorder. So with having said that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy uh, to take questions if there are any. And as you can see, this is a final slide. This gentleman here is actually Alois Alzheimer, who was one of the first uh, describing uh, neuropathological changes in the brains of people. At that stage, they're called dementia later on schizophrenia. And here you find uh, a lot of fine scientists which then visited Munich. Uh, I mean, uh, look about Louis, the Louis body Louis, and um, uh, Perusini or Zaletti and many others. With having said that, thank you very much. And I'm closing my talk. So, no question. Peter, it's your, Peter, it's your, uh, your guest. You need to mute. Uh, well, uh, uh, well, well, first of all, thank you very much for such uh, comprehensive approach uh, to the principle of treatment of schizophrenia, very contemporary one, uh, give the whole overview of uh, different, uh, different, uh, different points of view. Of course, I have a number of questions because uh, I understand uh, more or less your, um, I mean, clinical language. But at the same time, uh, knowing the tradition of the German psychiatry, I uh, uh, would like to ask you uh, uh, two, three things. I, uh, um, some uh, times ago, I, I made the analysis of comparative assessment of utilization of long acting uh, neuroleptics around the world in different uh, uh, parts. We compare, uh, for instance, US, we with the uh, utilization in um, uh, China, in, uh, in Japan, in uh, Germany, particularly in Spain and in Russia. In effect, the conclusion was not so positive because it's quite evident according to the different data that it's, uh, they have a quite positive results. But at the same time, utilization uh, of uh, this drug is not very large one and not, not very progressing. And of course, uh, somebody said that it is because of the prices. Uh, there are some different points of view, uh, but what is, what is your attitude? What is your opinion to this type of treatment of schizophrenia? So you, you mean uh, using a long acting antipsychotics? Yeah, yes, yes. Sure. yeah, yeah, purely, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, well, I, I should have put in the data there, but I, I'm always impressed. If you look at the longitudinal data uh, by the Finnish group of yes. Tijonen, who looked longitudinally for seven years and looked what happens to people discontinuing at year one to year seven. Yeah. And even at year seven, you had a increased rate of relapses. So, you know, my, my, my conclusion from that is that indeed, with the exception of the 20% of the usual people with schizophrenia, where we have one episode and then we don't have any episodes anymore, I think it is an illness which goes along with a high risk of relapses. Mm -hmm. And if we want to avoid this, I personally think you know, I always say, if my son is now 25, would develop psychosis, uh, I would try to convince him at least for the first two years to take a depot medication. Why? Because we know from uh, measurements in the blood that the level is uh, much uh, um, state, uh, more st uh, steady. Uh, than if you give oral, because then you have these little sort of bumps. That's one thing. The other thing is, I mean, treating even patients with multi-episode and severe schizophrenia, I try to convince and put them on a depot antipsychotic. Why? If you look at the PET data, you see that in once you have schizophrenia, the dopamine system is more labile, especially you have uh, environmental stressors. 
So the best protection is low dose antipsychotic. And I personally think that, you know, take a depot, possibly add some clozapine is my way to treating severe psychotic illness. And yeah, we need more studies for that, as you say, uh, Peter, because there are different experiences in different countries. But I would read the literature at the moment that the best antipsychotic treatment you can give to a patient in the early phases of psychosis and later on is long acting. I see. I see. Well, uh, of course, I have so, some other question, but there are a number of questions from the audience and I, I'm not abuse my position. So let's start. Uh, uh, first question, is physical activity associated with reduction in inflammation in schizophrenia? Yeah. In the beginning, after, so the activity is just finished, uh, it will go up, but then it will be reduced. So if you actually do that, as I said, 15 minutes per day, Included in your daily activity, it will actually not only improve your physical health, it reduces inflammation and it improves negative symptoms and cognition. I see. Thank you. Next question. Should we start clozapine earlier according to the optimized study? Yes. Yes, I think I think that I personally would say if you have a complete non response, for instance, after a first attempt, I would, you know, if I would be allowed, I would people put people on close with me, but I would say, uh, you know, you should actually treat every patient with schizophrenia who is not responding once in their life with clozapine. And often that is not regarded. I don't know why people are so anxious to use clozapine, but I think it's still the best option. And you spoke about Hans Hippius, who did a lot in order to induce uh, clozapine, not only in Germany, but worldwide. And what treatment do you recommend if clozapine and ECT fail to treat schizophrenia resistant? <laughs> Very good question. Yes. Well, what I what, what I do is I do um, discontinue all medication. Uh, so we do a drug holidays. Sometimes these patients don't get worse, but they have less side effects. If that is not working and they get more psychotic, I put them on a depot, uh, so long acting, in order to reduce the psychotic intensity. And to be honest, I give them some clozapine in the evening between 75 and 150 milligrams. That doesn't work always, but it works. And another little tip I give, if they have some effective component, I put them on a depot and then I add lithium. Because once they have an effective component, you can actually like an augmentative um, um, possibility add to the effect of the antipsychotic. So this is what I usually try. It doesn't work out always, but I'm surprised how often it works fine. I see. Well, some say that relapse after discontinuation is actually withdrawal of super sensitivity psychosis. What's your opinion? <laughs> well, good, good point, yeah. I would, I, would, I would say that there are arguments for that. So, yes, agree. Okay. And uh, well, a last question for, from, uh, from my list is from Russia, finally. Uh, Dr. Smirnov asked, what's about different protocols of TMS itself, as well as in combination with psychotherapy and physical uh, treatment in relation to improvement in cognition, negative symptoms in schizophrenia? So the question is about TMS. It's, it's an important question. I mean, if you look at meta-analysis, they seem to show a clear effect of negative symptoms uh, in schizophrenia. If you actually look at the biggest so far controlled studies, which Alkamid Hassan from our department did, um, and which was published in Biologic Psychiatry, that study, two arms, um, 73 per arm. So uh, actually intervention compared to placebo, uh, RTMS was completely negative. So it was so negative that 
people would say this is out. But the interesting thing is, if you then look into the data, uh, you can actually see that roughly 40 to 50% of the patients responded. And if you actually looked at those ones, um, they responded quite well. So my reading of that paper is um, you should actually use RTMS in patients with negative uh, with uh, with negative symptoms and uh, with negative symptoms but if it doesn't work after three weeks discontinue but if it works it's a very good and fine possibility to treat mm -hmm. well thank you there are no question well so i profit to have the last one very particular very probably naive you know, uh, in, 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 in my country, they are, uh, the people still uh, using the term proposed by uh, Eugen Bleuler uh, in this uh, four sign of schizophrenia, autism. Mm -hmm. And uh, because autism was eliminated from the uh, old classification and goes to child psychiatry and now it's disappear and so on and so on. But the latest, some, some investigation, uh, Baron Cohen and uh, one uh, Russian psychologist, uh, quite famous, Dr. Kolmogorov, they show that the main association of the main correlation are between social impairment and autism itself and uh, not to, for instance, uh, cognitive impairment. And probably it's too premature to eliminate from the negative symptoms this classical term of uh, Bleuler. Well, what, what is your opinion about it? Of course, I understand we, can go, uh, we cannot go uh, outside of the um, today's classification, but this is a reality of the research data. Well, I, I would I would I would say I, I like the concept of autism. The problem is you see that um, I mean if you look at childhood autism, but uh, adult or, or let's say yeah uh, adult autism, which we have actually now we have autistic spectrum disorder. I think there was an important move in order to uh, show that this is a distinct entity. With that, we have lost the autism and schizophrenia, which I think is a pity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do get your point that uh, we should have kept it, but um, well, <laughs> um, we've lost it due to a bit fine graining, which I think is good, fine graining of diagnostic uh, possibilities. So finding actually a new uh, component and possibly with that or no new disease entity, which we can actually treat differently. Uh, but I do get your point that there are autistic features which we need to take in account in schizophrenia as well. Well, thank you very much. They are well. Now we finished. You, you are, you know, you suffer a lot from from from. Uh, it's uh, too premature. Give me the floor because otherwise uh, we will kill you with the number of questions. Well, thank you. I, very I want to. I want to make a question. Last question. I have yeah, the sure. privilege. I have the privilege of the last question, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Peter, um, I, I would, uh, since this is uh, a Meet the Expert mm -hmm. um, series, uh, I would like to step out of the specific topic of your uh, speech and ask you a very general and very radical question. In your opinion, what is schizophrenia? Because a lot of mental disorders have hallucinations, a lot of mental disorders have depression-like symptoms. A lot of uh, mental disorders have whatever symptoms uh, you can find in schizophrenia. What is schizophrenia in your opinion? What, what, what makes schizophrenia to differ from other mental disorders and constitute some kind of Entity. A, unique, a unique or an umbrella? whatever group of disorders or a unique a single disorder whatever this is in your opinion what is this thing as well, a general as a general idea i mean yeah, yeah, not yeah, evidence based yeah. as your general experience says well i would i would say it's a it's a very good question i mean um what what is this different what what is in in this entity different from for instance uh, let's say drug-induced percussies or other organically um, sort of induced um, um, hallucination and things like that. Well, 
I think that uh, for the majority of people with schizophrenia, you have a continuous course where you actually reduce um, your uh, vulnerability or your ability to cope with normal stressors. And in addition to that, uh, which then leads to psychotic uh, symptoms, you have an increase or at least a steady amount of cognitive dysfunction and negative symptoms. I think this is something you don't have in other disorders. I mean, you have it in an attenuated form in bipolar disorder uh, or in depression, but I would say it's a step. And if you look at the biggest step of cognitive dysfunction and negative symptoms, that's in schizophrenia, followed by bipolar disorder and then unipolar depression. So my definition of that would, it's a disease entity where you have a relapsing course uh, with a stable or increasing residual symptomatology. This is something I would say you don't have in other disorders. But if you then open up the umbrella and you say, is that the same disorder? I would clearly say no. Mm -hmm. It's different entities. And if you ask me at my research, I would say there is a plasticity subtype. So there is a subtype where you, for instance, to exercise, cognitive remediation, what so forth, or TMS, which clearly gives you improvement. And you have another subgroup where does, that doesn't work. So it's the non-plasticity, possibly the uh, inflammatory subtype. Well, I would say we would need different ways to treat this. So I, I think, yes, there are common clinical features but under this umbrella of a common clinical picture, I think there are at least two big chunks. I would rather say even three. So two I said, one is plasticity and the other one is non-plasticity, rather inflammatory subtype. Interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you very, very much. Well, uh, I, I, I really, well, you know, you, you give, uh, you give uh, the idea for further uh, question, for further discussion. I think, uh, Dr. Falca, I, I think I'm absolutely sure that uh, we will invite you for another webinar uh, for sure and to talk about schizophrenia more deeply because it's still a question uh, which is not, um, which is an enigma. And uh, it is interesting sometimes to come back and to see how it's uh, developed the story and what is the present situation. It's uh, always discussing, it's always controversial, and it's always give us a new border, a new, how would say, grants, you know, for, for, the, for the discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think I have no any more question in my list, and uh, I appreciate very much um, uh, from my side, from the side of WEPA, the participation, wonderful webinar, I have a number of uh, reactions from different parts of the world. Thank you very much, Professor Salam. Thank you very much, Professor Falkai. And I greatly appreciate all efforts of Professor Fontoulakis who organized this fantastic webinar. Really great, great feedback from the audience. And don't forget it's, uh, it's uh, Sunday evening. The people are really in front of the screens. Yes. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thank you both for being here with us. Peter, Raymond, yes. thank you for your excellent contribution. Uh, for the audience, I would say that uh, we will have the next Meet the Expert in sometime in January. Uh, it will be announced soon. Thank you all for being here with us. Take care. And Thank you, Costas and Peter, bye for organizing bye bye. that. And it was Thank really you. interesting, even if it's Sunday evening. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.